Welcome to Episode 7 of Caucus Live, brought to you by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Houtman. Today we're going to talk about holster safety, holster selection, and how holsters influence concealment. Whether you're buying your first holster or you've been carrying for years, this information will help you make informed decisions about what's best for you. Welcome to episode 7 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're broadcasting live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Tell us where you're watching from, and as always, if you have questions for our guest, make sure to get them in before we go to break. So last week, we talked about the enormous and consequential decisions we have to make when we carry firearms. Today we're talking about another consequential decision, holsters. Because holster mistakes can have serious results, it's important to have a thorough education in the basics so you can make informed choices. As we go along here, we're not going to give you a list of good and bad holsters, and we're not going to talk about specific brands. Instead, we're going to give you the knowledge to evaluate a holster for yourself. If you're new to concealed carry, this will help you out. And if you've been carrying for a while, this will help you educate others. Because one cool thing about the gun community is that we all benefit from increased knowledge. The rising tide? lifts all boats. Today we're talking to John Heltman of Filster Holsters. John designs cutting-edge concealed carry equipment and he also created the Philly EDC YouTube channel where he provides open source lessons on how to make and refine your own Kydex holsters. Thanks for joining us today, John. Thanks for having me. So to start out with, what does a holster <clears throat> need to do? Well, there are three fundamental criteria for a holster. A holster has to retain the gun. That means the, the holster has to uh, keep the gun in the holster and also retain the holster to you in some fashion. It needs to fully cover the trigger guard of the gun in such a way that it prevents uh, uh, infiltration into the trigger guard of the gun as it's being carried. So if something is too soft, if it's too pliable, if it's cut in a dramatic way that exposes the trigger, that's not sufficient in terms of holster design. So when you say infiltration, you mean like something, you know, whether it's a hand grabbing and, and pushing through the material and activating the trigger, or right, like or if you're you, rolling on the ground and you hit a stick and the stick goes right into your trigger guard and hits the trigger. Or if you've tossed your holster into your purse and all the various and sundry things in your purse come into contact with your gun, that trigger needs to be protected completely. Oh yeah, or if you toss your holster in the gun safe and the holster is the way you uh, segregate it in the gun safe. Right. Or if you pick the soft holster up, or pick the soft, uh, pick the gun up by the soft holster in such a way that you could casually come into contact with the trigger. Can't be so soft that you uh, can touch the trigger and can't be so exposed that you can access the trigger. And uh, thirdly, the holster cannot collapse fully. You have to be able to put the gun back in the holster without having to open it up with your other hand. A holster must support single-handed reholstering. So we've got retain the gun, uh, keep the gun on your body. Yep. And keep uh, the gun in the holster and keep yep. the holster on your body. So reten retention is kind of a two-part thing, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, and then we've got protect the trigger fully from any interference. Yep. And then uh, maintain its shape with the gun removed. Gotcha. Okay. So so let's talk about that. So why is that so important? Well, first of all, if you're doing any kind of training uh, or practice, uh, if you are required to pry the holster open uh, with your uh, non-shooting hand, uh, it's very easy to muzzle or cover your support hand 
uh, in the process of reholstering the gun, and that's dangerous. You don't want to put holes in yourself. Uh, the other problem is that uh, very commonly I'll, I'll see people um, at classes or, you know, especially back in the day when I used to run a, uh, a custom shop, people would come over and they'd have their old holster with them, and I'd watch them do, like, very dangerous and scary things like uh, use the muzzle of the gun to fish that soft holster back open, and then you wind up pointing the whole gun uh, directly at your pelvis in a really worrying way. Um, I could demo that. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, people tend to use the muzzle of their gun inappropriately to worm it back into the holster, or they'll... Cross their hand. Yeah, or cross their hand in such a way that causes them to... Um, uh, endanger their own body and then finally you know uh, heaven forbid that you actually have to shoot anyone or even draw your gun in self-defense and not shoot um, maybe you're holding the hand of your child walking your dog on the leash you've got your cell phone or a flashlight in the other hand and that gun needs to go away quickly um, you need to be able to put that gun back in the holster single-handedly without relinquishing control over uh, your child, your dog, your, or your uh, other necessary equipment. Okay, so it's not just a training thing. And, and so you maybe can't necessarily say, um, well, I'm not going to train with it. I'm only going to carry it. So it's okay if it's collapsible? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's not. Because um, if you haven't trained with it, then you especially won't be prepared to manage all of the obstacles that it creates for you in a moment of need. Right, that makes total sense. All right. So I think that covers a little bit about kind of the basic functions of the holster right. and the three things that it needs to do. So those if are... You're, if you're considering the purchase of a holster and it does not meet one of those... If it fails to meet one or more of those criteria, the thing you're buying is a, a gun bag, gun sock, gun bucket, or uh, uh, some other non-holster product. So even though it may be marketed as a holster, it's not actually performing all the functions a holster needs to perform. Correct. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so next, let's talk a little bit about concealed carry. So we're not going to get into the debate about concealed versus open carry, because that's a little off topic for what we're doing today. Uh, but for the purposes of concealed carry, can we talk a little bit about why a person would want to conceal a gun? Right. So. Um why is concealment an important end state to accomplish, right? Uh, why do we want to conceal a gun? What are the benefits to uh, carrying concealed? Well, first of all, concealment uh, reduces uh, social friction. Um, it allows you to go about your day in a completely normal way uh, without any unwanted or uh, uh, friction generating uh, interactions with People who might be put off by the fact that you have a gun, encounters with uh, law enforcement, um, difficulty entering places, you know, you just carry your gun and blend in entirely. Uh, uh, concealment uh, causes you to uh, look normal and therefore are treated normally. And I like to be treated normally. Yeah, and, makes sense. Uh, uh, it's just a, a low friction, uh, uh, it's, it's a reduction in uh, social friction. The other thing is that uh, when you carry concealed uh, in any uh, potentially violent encounter or in any circumstance in which you have uh, uh, been selected as a victim for a violent crime, uh, concealment gives you the element of surprise. And surprise gives you uh, time, options, and advantages. Uh, if someone already knows that you have a gun, then they are faster to react to you accessing that gun. They see it, they expect it, and they anticipate that you're going to use it at some point. If they don't know that the gun is there, they will behave and encounter you differently. And then when it is time uh, that you are required to use the gun, they have to uh, reorient themselves in order to react to the presence of the gun. And that buys you time, options, and the element of surprise, which is... Uh, an advantage. Yeah, I think a lot of times when people talk about the element of surprise, they don't go into quite as much detail. Uh, but that's a really good point. So the element of surprise, it's not just like, ha, gotcha. No, it's like something that buys you time as they now have to confront the new challenge that they weren't ready for. So just how criminals sometimes will try to put you off guard 
uh, this is an opportunity for you to put them off guard and kind of force them into that same uh, confused decision making. Right. They need to now readjust everything that they're doing and encounter this new information and come up with another kind of plan on the spot. And it might uh, change the way that you're being attacked. They might uh, want to disengage. But uh, they, when somebody has certainty about a circumstance, then they can act quickly and with a great deal of deliberate, uh, with, with a great deal of deliberation. When they don't have certainty, uh, they don't have the opportunity to act quite as quickly and decisively. The other thing is um, it's common to hear people say things like, well, you know, nobody notices that you're printing anyway. Everyone's got their head buried in their phone. Um, you know, no one's even paying attention. Everyone has their own problems. They, nobody ever notices me printing. Well, my uh, response to that is two things. One, how often do you notice somebody printing out in the world? I bet all of us are pretty good at spotting concealed guns at this point, right? And if we're good at it, somebody else is good at it. And I don't carry my gun because of the people who are, you know, buried in their phones and oblivious. I carry my gun because of dangerous people. Dangerous people can spot your gun. Yeah, so the person with their head buried in the cell phone, uh, you know, that's thinking about their cup of coffee isn't going to necessarily spot your gun, but who cares? Right. I don't care if they... Right. I don't care if they can tell I'm printing because they're not the reason we carry a gun in the first place. Yeah. And the, the, the reason that we carry a gun, that type of person is the type of person we don't want to see it. Right. Exactly. Uh, the kind of people who are capable of noticing that you're printing and noticing all the various tells that uh, you're carrying a gun are exactly the kinds of people that we don't want to have this kind of interaction with in the first place. And they are good at it because they've been doing it for a while. Yeah, yeah, they're going to definitely beat you with experience there, I think. Yes, for sure. Okay, well, so I think we've covered a lot about why concealment is valuable, so why we want to conceal the gun. We are going to take a quick break, so get your questions in now. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why some holsters conceal better than others and what uh, influences concealment. So we'll talk a little bit about the factors that influence, influence concealment and how you can learn to pick those out. Hi, it's Brian Strauser, chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and the shooting sports. Please consider joining us as a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month, or choose one of our other annual membership options. You can learn more about us at gunowners.mn and become a member at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to John Houtman from Filster about holster safety and selection. So before the break, we talked about why concealment matters. And next up, we're going to talk about how you get good concealment. Uh, before we start the segment, John, real quick, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find us at filsterholsters.com uh, and at the Philly EDC YouTube channel if you want to follow up on any of the information. Uh, that we're giving out here. Uh, last year around this time, uh, we got invited to the Active Self-Protection uh, Conference where we had the opportunity to present a, uh, a talk on concealment, which was recorded. Uh, it's under uh, concealment principles on the channel. So any more information that you wanna follow up in depth that we touch on here, because this will be uh, uh, general and not 100% comprehensive, you can get more details uh, at the channel there. So this is the abridged version. And if you want to do a really deep dive on concealment, definitely check that out. Yeah. I think you've got about a 45 minute video that's just strictly concealment. Oh yeah. Um, but we also did sort of break it down into uh, easier to digest segments. But this is definitely the Cliff's Notes and it should be enough to sort of get you started on uh, what you should at least be looking for in a holster if, uh, if you're looking for more than just the basics or if you've been frustrated with a, a kind of uh, trial and error holster selection process. 
So we defined, uh, or so we talked about why concealment matters, but how would you define concealment? So what, what are we talking about when we talk about concealment? Well, in terms of concealing a gun and equipment, um, what we're talking about is the uh, circumstance that occurs when uh, the inorganic shape of the gun is not conspicuous among the organic shapes of your body, right? So <clears throat> people notice what's different. They'll notice a bulge or a limp, very subtle th things about each other that are um, not, uh, maybe not immediately obvious, but they can tell when something's off and someone can tell at a glance that maybe there's uh, an angular shape or a uh, irregular shape that doesn't match the shape of a human body. Um, and when you're concealing a gun, what you uh, want to do is, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're having a little technical issue here. I'm oh, super, no, we're good. I'm super distracted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, where was I? Right, okay, so our eye is drawn to what's different and what stands out about someone. So you'll notice an angular or, or an inorganic shape among their body, right? Like you'll see, you can spot immediately when someone's got a cell phone under their shirt or any other kind of thing. So we see what's different about people. And the whole objective of a concealment holster is to take the uh, inorganic and angular shapes of the gun and subdue them uh, into the organic and predictable and expected shapes of the human body. Right, okay, so here's where we get into the fun part with the diagrams. Okay, so let's say we're looking at uh, a body, and this will just be top down. So this is like the waist, right? Here's the, here's the front of the body, and we've got uh, a person, right? Here's their feet, right? Um, and we have the gun. Right, there's a uh, a gap here, a, a distance. This this outer edge is always going to poke out, like when you're wearing clothes or when you're, your shirt's going to drape over this in a way that becomes uh, fairly obvious. Right. Um, what we need to do in order to accomplish concealment is to eliminate this and cause the uh, gun to conform to the body. So, uh, how do you get the gun? to conform to the body. Um, in some cases, you'll see holsters and they'll be made in such a way where, okay, let's, we'll do this again down here, right? Here's, here's our body. And someone will say, okay, well, I've got this holster and I've curved the holster to fit the body and then put a gun on it, right? The degree to which the holster is curved isn't necessarily gonna change the relationship between the gun and the body. If the curve matches the body, then the gun remains uh, tangent to the uh, the body. And when the gun is tangent to the body, you don't get concealment. The gun isn't conforming to the body, right? Okay, so what you need is some mechanism in the holster, either in its design material or uh, added on features in some way that causes it to conform to the body. And that's accomplished with various kinds of asymmetry, right? So for example, if the holster itself isn't curved, but is instead maybe set up in such a way where the front of it curves and then the back of it is more straight, and then you've got the, the gun on there, when the belt moves through the holster and this backside, when it's tightened up, you'll actually pull or rotate the holster inward. So here's a, that's an example of how uh, asymmetry generates concealment. So if we're looking at the uh, gun from the top down. Imagine this is our waist and we're looking down at the holster. Uh, a holster, you know, like a pancake holster, if the wings are perfectly symmetrical and the same, then that doesn't give you any grip rotation. But if instead they are a little flatter on the trailing edge, then as the belt tightens, we pull the grip of the gun inward. And as we pull the grip of the gun inward, then it conforms to the body and reduces printing. Right, so that's the basics of one way an outside the waistband holster can uh, manage concealment and give you better results. Inside the waistband holsters, 
uh, do that a number of ways, but they still use asymmetry. The asymmetry is going to be built generally into the uh, front and the back of the holster. So imagine we're looking down or inside the waistband holster, and uh, let's say this is the front of the body with our little COVID-19 edition going on there, and here's the belt. The gun, let's say, you know, just for example, we're carrying appendix, the gun is going to want to uh, remain tangent to the body in the same way. How do we get the grip to rotate into the body? Well, we can do a couple of things. We can put a wedge on the back, which creates a little bit of a fulcrum to drive the grip of the gun inward, or we can build out some kind of asymmetry on the front. Some holsters have molded into the face a little bit of a wedge. This is an exaggeration. So when you tighten down the belt, that's forced inward in such a way that causes the grip to rotate. Um, in other circumstances, there might be a wing attached over here with enough room for a firing grip. So when the belt tightens down, that applies pressure inward towards the gun as well. Um, and that's, you know, managed with uh, asymmetry. Where are we at? Am I getting off track here? No, no that, that, that makes sense to me. Okay. So basically you're just trying to take those like sharp corners and tuck them in or hide them compared to the, the shape of the body or even the drape of the clothing. Right. So a lot of this uh, always, of course, depends a little bit on what you're wearing. So for example, let's take a look at this as though we were uh, looking at a body from the side. So here's our here's our face here, right? And uh, we've got shoulders and chest or what have you. And here's our here's our waistline, right? Um, depending on how you're built, right? And we've got legs, right? Depending on on how you're built. If your chest is larger than uh, your belly, or relatively flat, then you then your clothing is going to drape down the face of uh, is going to drape a little bit and give you a place to hide that gun pretty well. So you might not necessarily need as much grip rotation as someone else. Now, however, if you're shaped like most of us, and maybe you're a little bit more like that in the front, um, that's going to do a couple of things that are a little difficult for you. One is that you don't get draping until it's at or below the belt line, right? Because you've got the uh, apex of the belly to deal with. And the other problem is that uh, I know that I do this too. So as I gain weight through this area, uh, my pants tend to ride a little bit lower and I never just say, okay, well, I've, you know, I was a 34, maybe I need to be a 36. No, you stay a 34, you just are a 34 at a lower and lower point on your body. So then what happens with people in this circumstance is that the gun tends to be oriented like that, or you know maybe, maybe from the back you're shaped a, a, a little more like that at the waistline with a little bit of muffin top, and that's going to cause the gun to tilt out like this at this kind of angle. So you need to have something in effect that drives the gun back inward this way um, and also prevents the top of the gun from tipping out as the uh, pressure of your body is applied to it. Now there's something to keep in mind about that. That gets us into the next really important principle of uh, concealment here, uh, which we refer to as the keel principle. I want you to imagine the keel of a ship, right? Like a sailboat, for example. A schooner. A schooner. It's, it's not a sailboat. It's a schooner. 90s kids will get that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's say we've got a boat in the water. We've got boats in the, the water. And there's quite a bit of, you know, sail above the water. How, how are we going to manage this ship from tipping over? Well, at some point you've got to put some kind of keel on the bottom of it that will resist that tip. So as the top of the boat tips, this encounters the pressure of the water and it doesn't tilt quite as easily. It won't fall completely over necessarily. Right? So how does what does that have to do 
with concealing a gun, right? How does how do these two things work together? Well, what happens is that imagine that your belt line, uh, your, let's say this is a body here, and we've got the belt line. This is the this is the front, right? And we've got the gun here. There's the grip. There's the trigger guard, and there's the muzzle. Um, you need to have enough keel under the belt line to stabilize the gun. So what a lot of people do is they fall into the trap of saying, well, I'm going to get like a small gun. I'm going to get a Glock 43. I'm going to get a, a SIG uh, P365. I'm going to get the one with the short barrel. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cram 10, 11, however many magazine, um, uh, rounds of ammo that you possibly can uh, into this magazine. And what that does is that makes this top heavy. That's like putting a whole bunch of sails uh, on this ship without putting a keel on it. And then what happens is that maybe the shape of your body or you're using a belt that's really stiff and it doesn't conform to you and it actually pulls the gun uh, away from the body a little bit. Uh, what happens is the top of the gun tips out and you get printing and then the muzzle of the gun tips inward and you get poking and then people wonder I bought this little gun it's it's supposed to be great for concealment how come it's so uncomfortable and how come it prints so badly well because you don't have a keel and what you actually need in that case is a holster that's slightly longer than the gun and what that does is that balances out the weight uh, of the gun by uh, providing a little bit of resistance to tip tipping out and it also increases the surface area that's in contact with your body uh, and uh, the more surface area there is the less acute the pressure of the gun against your body is right so if, for example if you step on a Lego it really hurts if you step on a phone book it doesn't hurt at all uh, and that has to do with the amount of pressure, your weight, on that tiny surface area. And the same thing is happening here when you've got a little tiny gun that's poking into you and tipping out over the belt. That seems so counterintuitive. It's like, oh, I want a smaller gun so I can conceal it better. But right. but sometimes that's not always the answer. Uh, smaller guns are not... A lot of people struggle with concealing small guns. Or they'll put a tiny gun in a soft holster and think that it's uh, getting them something when in fact um, with the right holster with the right holster you can carry a bigger gun than you think and also uh, with the right holster uh, you don't necessarily need to struggle with the disappointment of buying a small gun expecting the gun to do the work of concealing for you yeah i think a lot of times people think oh, i just i my gun prints too badly i need a smaller gun and they just really need a, a more thorough grounding in the principles of a concealment to get the most out of what they have. And at that point, like, okay, you're always going to hit a boundary somewhere, right? So like you have a limit with how much your shirt is going to drape. So you can only conceal so much there before you start to push out that fabric and get printing. And the gun you have might fit into that limit and that might be okay. Or you might want to wear a tighter shirt and you might actually need a smaller gun to fit that limit. So it's like, there's always a limit somewhere. Uh, but if you know the principles of concealment, you can get the most out of whatever combination you have on you. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, it would take a considerable amount of work to, for example, conceal a Glock 34 with an RMR and an X300 on either me or Sarah. Um, I'm fairly short, so the length of that's going to wind up giving me some problems, and Sarah's fairly uh, narrow, and so uh, without completely altering our wardrobes, that would start to be tricky. I could probably get away with it um, in a hoodie. I know I can do a 19, but you know some of this is going to depend on what the you know radius and, and circumference of your body are, how your clothing drapes over you, uh, your belt selection, for example. You know, one of the problems that we run into all the time is that I'll get an email for a, from a customer, for example, who says, "I just bought one of your holsters, and I've got this, you know, three eighths inch thick steel reinforced." leather made in by God America gun belt and I know my belt is good enough for concealed carry how come I'm having uh, comfort and concealment issues well one of the things that we talk about is 
is uh, how um, the belt needs to conform to your body too. Because the, if your belt, for example, this is especially true inside the waistband carry. If your belt doesn't conform to your body, then it's not conforming to the features of the holster that cause the gun to conform to your body, right? So, uh, and real quick before we get too far into like inside the waistband, can you say is there any utility to having a thick, sturdy belt for outside the waistband? Especially if you have a heavy gun, yes, because two th two different things are happening here. With an outside the waistband holster, the gun is hanging off of your belt, and it's going to want to uh, tip away. So the belt is going to need to resist that tip over and not torque as much when uh, uh, the weight of the gun is applied. And inside the waistband belt is hugging that gun into you. And uh, so the same level of stiffness is almost counterproductive. Yes, it's often very counterproductive uh, because if the if you're shaped, oh, let me start this over again. How many times can I take the cap off this marker to make that squeaky noise? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say you're shaped a little more narrow, like that, but your gun belt is shaped like that. This is an, an abstraction and an exaggeration, so bear with me. And it's really rigid. It's this rigid wagon wheel of gun belt, right? It's shaped like that, and you're more shaped like this. So once you start putting on your concealment gear, you're going to have gaps in there. And uh, what's going to happen is as you tighten this up, it doesn't really conform to you. And they're in, in those gaps, in those places where the belt wants to push out away from you rather than pull into you, it will wind up pulling the gun towards the belt rather than acting on the features of the holster that cause it to rotate. And as the gun is pulled away towards the belt, it's going to tip out more because it's no longer supported by your body uh, on the body side. And you're going to get printing and you're going to get muzzle drive back into the body. So a stiff belt for inside the waistband carry uh, can wind up causing you some issues. You want it to conform to your body because that's what you're trying to make the gun do. So you don't want it too thin where it's it doesn't no, offer no. enough support, but you don't want a big super, super reinforced belt like you would for, like say you had a big uh, competition holster that wanted to tip out really bad. Right, so um, the belt should be uh, stiff in this dimension so that when you draw the gun, the belt doesn't collapse or wrinkle or buckle, uh, but it should be flexible in this dimension, in and out, right? So on the... Uh, the narrowest width, let's say you've got an inch and a half belt, the part of the belt that's an inch and a half should be pretty stiff. Uh, the part of it that's 36 or 38 inches around should be fairly flexible uh, to a point that uh, you can actually get it to act on the gun in the way that uh, accomplishes the concealment you want to accomplish. All right, that's good insight. Uh, anything else you want to cover before we go to break? No, I think, I think that's about it for now. All right, so we talked a little bit about what makes guns conceal. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about deceptive marketing. We'll talk a little bit about dangerous products, and uh, we'll talk a little bit, if we have time, about car holsters. All right, stick with us. We'll be right back. The Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus is a single-issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the rights of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and shooting sports. Please consider becoming a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month. You can learn more at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to John Helpman of Filster Holsters, and we're talking about concealment principles and concealment in general. So holster selection, holster safety. Uh, we just covered pretty thoroughly how to get a gun to conceal on your body. And next we're gonna talk uh, a little bit more about uh, deceptive marketing and dangerous products. So we've already discussed that a little bit. I'm not necessarily sure that most of the marketing is intentionally deceptive. I right. think a lot of it is accidentally deceptive because there's some telephone game involved in uh, how people come to learn things about holsters or what have you, or just the uh, assumptions that they make about them, right? So people will say, well, you know, we've taken, you know, we just learned about the keel principle. So uh, uh, 
if if a holster isn't uh, doing anything to prevent belt tip over, uh, when they say something like, this is the most uh, comfortable and concealable holster ever, right? Which is marketing speak. You're going to want to ask, okay, how does it do that? Does it have any kind of wing or claw or wedge or asymmetry built into the holster that actually accomplishes the things the holster company says it does, right? And that's, you know, some of this is just uh, hype or, or advertising, and it's easy to put a whole bunch of superlatives in front of something without anything to necessarily back them up. But now you're armed with the knowledge to go out into the world and be a discerning holster customer and make sure that when you're shopping for something to solve your concealment issues, and you are looking at a holster on a website or exploring a brand, if they don't actually do any of these things in any way, if they don't have some kind of asymmetry built into the holster or any kind of, uh, uh, you know, mechanical uh, advantage being exerted on the gun as a result of the holster, then uh, you can stop taking their claims about any kind of like unique or super superlative levels of comfort or concealment uh, you can stop taking those claims seriously and move on to a, a brand that actually builds these features into their holsters. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they're not necessarily trying to trick you, but they're just trying to sell you a product. So it's like they'll make a lot of wild claims and a lot of them don't really hold up when you when you start looking at the actual physics and principles involved in the holster. You might look at it and say, well, I don't see how it can conceal that well because there's no pressure exerted on the gun to make it tuck into my body. So now that you have the, the skill and the, uh, uh, the insight to be able to judge that for yourself, you can probably avoid a lot of the slick marketing claims. Yeah, and some of it's not even all that slick. Some of it's just a, a, a bunch of people who don't carry all that much and don't do any kind of like real training or they're of the mind that, oh, you know, no one cares if you're printing. So if it prints a lot, you know, who, who really cares? They're not really concerned with actual with like what the maximum potential concealment is. And they just sort of were like, well, you know, this works fine enough for me and I'm a low information customer myself. And so they think it's fine. They might not actually just, they must, they might not just actually know any better. Yeah, so they're not har trying to harm anyone. They just genuinely don't have the depth of knowledge to, to make a really truly useful product. Yeah, I think uh, an example of that one of my friends was talking about the other day was a, a holster that uh, that had a wing and a fabric clip. And the holster was marketed uh, with the with the intent. I'm going to use your uh, from above here. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, so the holster was marketed. As, uh, uh, so like, here's your waistline. Do, do, there we do go. you want me to draw? Do you want yeah, to draw? yeah. Draw, draw a waistline for me. Lynn. So here's, that's the waistline. Okay, so the holster was marketed uh, with the wing, and it was said that, like, so say this part here is going to be the wing. I draw so much better than you do. Yeah, that's art school. You've you got an edge on me there. <laughs> uh, so the way it was marketed is that the holster adheres to the fabric, and pushes the fabric out. You're you're saying it's to... designed to be used uh, without a belt. Yes, yes, okay. correct. So, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So it clips, so your yoga it clips pants. to the fabric, you know, yoga pants or leggings, or whatever you're wearing. And it was marketed as a design to push the fabric away from the gun to conceal the gun. But now, um, having watched this broadcast, you'll probably notice that what it's actually designed to do, what the wing is supposed to do, is leverage belt pressure to pull the gun into the body. Right, so that's what it's actually supposed to do. So what's going on there is there's a holster company out there that that perhaps doesn't understand the purpose of a wing, and they're not intending to be deceptive in their marketing, but they're just they're marketing it with an incorrect understanding of how it works. Yeah, there's a lot of like monkey see monkey do that happens. So there might be like even some like cargo cult going on. So a company will see that you know all of the uh, you know uh, top. 10 holster companies or whatever have this feature built into their holster. So we're going to do that too because these people are doing it and we might not necessarily have a really great grasp of why. And then they know it's supposed to be good. Like if this part on our holsters is good, then we need to come up with a reason why it's good. And it could be that, you know, this part's good, so there's no way that it can be bad. So even if it's not 
giving us the concealment that we expect it to uh, in these other circumstances, we're going to say that this is good because this part is good. It's like, you know, whatever this touches turns to gold in a certain way. And so uh, you wind up in a circumstance where someone makes the claim that uh, this narrow wing that's designed explicitly to work in the presence of a belt to accomplish the uh, rotation of the grip of the gun into the body to reduce concealment. Actually, what we're going to say is that this pushes the fabric of your pants away uh, in a lumpy, obvious way, and that's what makes it concealed. So now you know certain things about uh, what kind of features to look for and how those features work and what you can expect them to do uh, with your body. You know, And so every body type is going to be a little different. Before we yeah. get back into this. Um, that's going to give you, I think, a huge edge when you're shopping because uh, you'll be able to see some of the claims they make and you'll be able to evaluate for yourself whether or not they are true or whether they can be true. Before we get too far, there's something that I wanted to mention that I forgot to put down in the notes. Um, fitting a holster to your body is a lot like a prosthetic process. So for example, if someone has like a, an amputated limb, uh, what will happen is that, uh, let, let's say the, the limb is amputated, you know, just below the elbow. Most of that limb is going to be a pre-manufactured, um, off the shelf, largely, um, construction. But then there's going to be the part of it that needs to fit specifically to the actual uh, remaining limb on the human body. And that's going to be different for everyone. It's not going to be like a glove, right? Where you can get a small, medium, or large glove and they're going to fit your hands pretty much the same. The, uh, the, the remaining stump of limb is going to be very unique depending on the trauma that was inflicted and how it was put back together and how it healed. So the part of the prosthetic that fits directly onto your body needs to be highly customized and tuned and adjusted fairly frequently in order to make sure that it continues to work with your body. And there's an element of that that occurs with holsters too. So what, you, what you're looking for with a holster isn't a, I'm going to take it out of the box and it's going to be the best thing ever and it's going to solve all my problems. It's a little bit more like when you get a new pair of boots where you know that the sole of the boot is good, the steel toe is good, all the features of the boot are good, but you might personally need a little bit of an insole in there to help them fit a little bit better and to increase certain uh, comfort issues, uh, 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 to solve certain comfort issues and to give you maybe a little bit more support. And a holster is like that too. You're starting with a uh, baseline, which you are then going to put in a little bit of time and effort to fit to your body. So for example, we were talking about like wings and wedges and whatnot. So we've got uh, another person here, right? So while you're drawing, I'll just say, so even with this knowledge, which will definitely help, it's still gonna be a little bit of an experience, uh, a learning curve uh, to get something to fit specifically to you in a comfortable way. Right. Okay, so let's say we've got a person here and they've got a little bit of a gut and there's not that much that they can do about it. Right, so they've got their gun. Let's let's see, let's do even better than that. They've got their gun, and it's concealing pretty well, right? So um, it's kind of pulled into the squishy bits a little bit there. Yeah, as much as they can, and they've got uh, that's going on pretty well. And the grip is rotated pretty far inward, so that's doing okay. But they're still getting this point here, and their belly is actually pushing the gun out here. So what you can do is you can either buy a holster that has this feature built in or you can make it yourself. You know, like if you go to like a sporting supply store and you get a hold of like a yoga block, for example, or any other kind of foam, uh, or other companies, for example, like my friend Tom Kelly at Dark Star Gear um, sells little foam pads. So you can Velcro a little foam pad onto the holster down here at the muzzle. And what that'll do is if you've got a bit of a, a belly or a curve that you need to accommodate and you want the top of the gun to rotate into the body, you can fill in the gap that's created here between the belly and the gun or the lower abdomen and the gun with like a little foam wedge or foam piece that you put on there and you can uh, shape that to fit your specific circumstance yourself. And you keep an eye on it and you make sure it doesn't get worn down or soft or anything like that. And you can build it back up or replace it uh, 
as necessary in order to uh, maintain the level of comfort and concealment that you need. But it's important to start with a platform that can support that kind of addition and modification. And you should also expect that when you buy a holster that uh, you might need to put in a little bit of work because the holster maker puts in 80, 90% of the work and provides you with a holster that fits all three of the requirements we talked about at the beginning, uh, has features on it that work to accomplish concealment uh, in the way that they claim. But this last little bit of how it fits you is a little bit up to you because nobody can make something that fits everybody because we're all a little bit different. So this is, uh, this is your insole. This is your specific fitting that makes your holster, holster specific to your body in a way that uh, can't be done without your hands-on involvement. Customizing, right. So we've got a couple of great audience questions here. Uh, real quick, so we're not gonna, we weren't planning on really talking a lot about brands. We wanted to give you more criteria on how to evaluate what you're looking at purchasing. Um, but we did have a question, uh, John, for you about, are there any belt brands you find work better? Okay, so let me give you a rundown on features that I look for in a belt for inside the waistband or especially for appendix carry. I don't like big buckles on appendix carry holsters uh, because as you stack up um, the gun behind the belt, the buckles tends to stick out or you have to then offset the buckle um, so if you've got like a big buckle on your belt here, and then you put the gun behind it, you're going to push the belt buckle forward, which is going to make a lot of printing. Um, or the alternative is that you then wear your belt buckle at the, um, like 11 or 10 o'clock position, which then starts to get a little awkward and uncomfortable, for example. Yeah. That kind of hurts my hip actually when I do that. Yeah. So I, I also look for a smaller buckle. When you got to har hurry into that rest stop, uh, <laughs> It, it, uh, it'll slow you down. You know, you gotta be speed, surprise, and violence of action are, uh, crucial, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I like a belt that's got a really low profile buckle that I can uh, position where I, wherever I prefer. Uh, also, I don't like really heavy, really reinforced belts for IWB or AIWB. So uh, I like them to be fairly flexible, like a something like, you know, like the Wilderness Five Stitch Belt has been around for ages, uh, something like that. Um, uh, and, and, and a few other things that are, are fairly similar to that. Uh, not overly stiff, not reinforced, not um, uh, like if they've got like a, a plastic reinforcement or a steel reinforcement uh, inside the belt, that's going to be too much for um, inside the waistband carry, generally speaking. So not too thick, basic, more or less nylon, uh, and a low profile buckle are my, the things I look for in a, a good appendix carry belt. Thank you. All right. So next we're, we're going to touch on this question briefly. Uh, we're not going to get actually too deep into it because, uh, our next episode is about the concealment lifestyle. So that's going to get a lot more into fashion. It's going to get it more into practical tips for concealment and for concealed carry. Um, but just briefly, let's touch on this one. Uh, what are your thoughts on garments that help with concealment examples of fabric colors, patterns, uh, anything you think is helpful there? Well, uh, I can only really speak for myself. I find that, uh, dark colors and busy patterns conceal pretty well, you know, like a, like a dark plaid, you can hide anything under it. It's just like the uh, principles of camouflage, you know? Um, so anything that kind of breaks up that line of a potential print, right? You know, uh, but generally speaking, I kind of tend to wear a little bit of whatever I want. Um, as long as it doesn't fit me too tight. Um, and uh, uh, as long as it doesn't fit me too tight and it's not too clingy and it sort of drapes over where I need it to drape uh, pretty well, the, uh, the holster does most of the work for me. I'm, I've actually, it's, it's hard for me to talk about this because we've been experimenting with stuff that doesn't even uh, matter what you wear. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't exist yet, so we'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, I, I find similar for myself. Um, so like my wardrobe obviously is different being female. 
Um, I tend to like asymmetric patterns like florals uh, and you know some of those different types of like florals are abstract patterns uh, for my tops. Uh, the reason I like those is because sometimes even with a geometric pattern you'll still see some lines. So the geometric patterns don't always break up the lines. Uh, but the floral and the asymmetric patterns do a better job of that, I think. Uh, I also like to dress to draw attention away from my waistline. Uh, so if you can imagine how you would dress if you were trying to like hide a muffin top, or you wanted to emphasize your shoulders, uh, or even you know wearing uh, necklaces or earrings that draw the eye up away from the waistline, or interesting shoes that draw the eye down away from the waistline. All of those things can affect concealment uh, by affecting the psychology of the people obser observing you. Misdirection. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of. And we are going to get in a little deeper into that uh, next week. All right, let's check here. Um, I would say that, like John, I do, I tend to uh, set up my holster to give me maximum concealment, and then I wear whatever I want. Uh, so that's kind of my general principle, but you know, it's it's different uh, if you're wearing a tight t-shirt and yoga pants versus wearing a, a button-down, you know, or a sweater and jeans. Um, so it kind of depends. You always work within limitations. So you've got limits somewhere. You can only tip the grip so far out before it prints. You can only tip it so far in before the muzzle starts to tip out with kind of like a seesaw effect. Um, so it's kind of kind of like thinking within the box and doing the best you can within those limitations uh, and then dressing in a, a way that kind of helps to support that but also expressing your own personal style you know what i've noticed i do what's that i don't dress around my gun i gun around how i'm dressed yeah i just wear whatever i want and if i'm if i don't you know if i just want to wear like a t-shirt and shorts and i don't really care all that much i'll just put on the j-frame you know like i match my gun to how i'm dressed not how i'm dressed to the gun that i want to carry and that brings up an interesting concealment principle as well. And I know John and I, we've talked about this before, but John has uh, kind of a level of printing. So there's printing where you can directly see the outline of the gun. And then there's telling where you're sending other signals that indicate that you have a gun, even if the gun itself is not visible. Can you go into that a little more? Right. So for example, um, you could have a gun that's fully concealed and it doesn't print at all, but it's concealed under your NRA branded fishing vest. <laughs> that's the same as, that's just as obvious as printing, right? Or if you're wearing your 511 pants and your, your khaki 511 pants and your um, Sig Sauer branded uh, corporate polo shirt and you've got your Oakleys on and you're wearing your uh, Punisher skull ball cap with your uh, Solomon boots on, everyone knows you have a gun, even if it doesn't print at all. Because the gun isn't printing, your whole personality and style of dress are printing. Like if you look like a cop or a bail enforcement agent or a, someone from the warrant squad, or you uh, look like someone who works at a gun shop, like you can print with your presence. I mean, so for example, I remember one time I was out at a restaurant. I had just come from the range. I still had my gun on me and it was like, it still was hot and smelled like gunpowder. Like I had just gotten done. I'm sitting there. I, you know, just pick a regular seat at the restaurant. And this guy walks in and he's dressed in this sort of, you know, like shot show tuxedo. And he takes off his Oakleys and he puts them on the back of his head, right? Which is uh, something that I've noticed people with a certain background do. And he scans the room very deliberately walks over to the seat in the far corner where he can see the whole room and rearranges the table so he can sit with his back directly in the corner and see the entire room full of people and then sits there and orders his food and I'm like dude is in condition orange a hundred percent of the time and he thinks he's being like slick and aware and he didn't even make eye contact with me or anything and I know that he's a dude who has a gun because of how he acts and how he presents himself and how he behaves and how he stands out. He stands out in a way that no one else who walked in there stood out. And he didn't notice me noticing him. And that's the difference between printing and telling. So so he, telling is almost like your behavior is printing. <laughs> yes, your, 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 your behavior uh, 
your aura is printing. Everyone can can uh, you know you're glowing in the in the Jeff Cooper color codes, and uh, that's you know if it's obvious to me, it's obvious to people who you don't want it to be obvious to, and then they have all the surprise, and you have none of it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything you want to cover that we didn't get to? I do want to cover something. It's yeah. a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, and okay. I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings. But I need to tell you to please stop using car holsters. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, need, I need to beg you to stop using car holsters. Okay, so a couple things. Uh, one is that most... We talked about how... Um, one of the criteria for a holster is that it holds, that it re retains its shape uh, in order to prevent uh, gun handling accidents where you're not flagging yourself, you're not doing any kind of contortion to get the gun back into the holster, and reholstering is safe and easy. That's because most of the gun accidents, most, most of the self-inflicted gunshot wounds that are caused by accident occur during holster use. Someone get something stuck in the trigger guard when they're putting their gun back in the holster or they get their finger on the trigger when they're drawing the gun and they have a gun handling accident uh, um, <laughs> uh, in and around the holster. When you have a holster on your body and a holster in the car, you are increasing the number of times that you have to take that gun in and out of the holster. And you're doing it in a confined, difficult space where you need to contort yourself in order to do it safely. And people have accidents when swapping in and out uh, from the holster uh, in their vehicle. The other thing is, things don't stay in one place in the vehicle when you have a car accident. Well, I just want to clarify something real quick before we move on to that part. So you're basically saying like, Every time you handle your gun, you increase the odds of an accident. So what you're talking about is basically like trying to engineer your life so that you handle your gun as little as necessary. Yeah, you don't want to handle it excessively. Um, in the case of doing practice, for example, you're uh, doing it in a safe and controlled way. And if you're dry firing, you know, that some people might say, well, what about dry fire? Well, you've removed all the ammunition and all the sources of ammunition from the gun. And that's what uh, increases the safety of it. You're not managing a loaded gun in a confined area where you need to twist your body around to get it in and out of the hole. Yeah, thing. and with dry fire, you're handling it intentionally as well. So you're not just like, oh, well, got groceries, got to put the gun over here and you've got 10 other things on your mind. You're, you're concentrating on your dry fire and you're concentrating on your intentional, safe, careful handling of the firearm. Another thing to uh, take in con into consideration is that most of the surfaces on the inside of your gun, uh, inside of your vehicle, are not fit for attaching a gun. A gun's a fairly heavy thing for the most part, and we know that the uh, that weight, as the mounting surface experiences it, is going to increase as a result of inertia. So, if your gun weighs, you know. 13 ounces or what have you, and you have a car accident, that 13 ounces is going to continue to move forward, plus whatever uh, inertia adds to it, and whatever surface it's attached to might not be made to uh, support that weight. Chances are the surface you have it attached to is made to be cheap and cover ugly structures and wires on the inside of your uh, the passenger cabin of your vehicle. None of that stuff is especially load-bearing. And in a worst-case scenario, uh, for example, most modern cars have a knee airbag. One of the major mechanisms of injury in a car accident is to the knees of the driver. When you have a car accident, your body continues to move forward, your whole body. You're the, it's not just that the top of your body pitches forward into the steering wheel, it's that your legs and buttocks move forward in the seat as well, and then your knees collide with the underside of the dash. And a lot of manufact manufacturers put in a knee airbag in the area under the dashboard. Guess where a lot of people like to attach their car-mounted holster? Oh, it's right here under the dashboard. Um, if you have an airbag under your dashboard, you are turning that gun into a dangerous projectile should you in, have a car accident uh, where that airbag deploys. And let me tell you, your chances of having a car accident are so much higher than being in a defensive gun use. Um, if you don't have a knee airbag uh, in that area, you've positioned the gun in exactly the right spot 
to cause a really terrible knee injury. You know, uh, like so, the, you, you're the underside of the dash that doesn't have a knee airbag is going to injure your knees more than newer cars that have a knee airbag. You've increased the amount of injury that can occur there. And it might not necessarily be a head on collision. So it's not, it's like, well, it's not directly in front of me. It's off to the side. People move around considerably in a car accident. And even if it, most of that is fairly hard plastic to the touch, um, it's not as hard as your gun. And some of it's even a little bit padded, right? Um, you don't want to put things in the wheel well of your vehicle, especially not hard mounted like that, because they can increase the chance of injury to you. And if any of that breaks in a, in a car accident, um, now you've got an unsecured gun in your vehicle. Yeah, so you're better off almost just to get a holster that is comfortable, that you can conceal on your body and keep on your body. Uh, and then even if you need to leave your car in a hurry, then you've still got it on you. Right, you shouldn't have to remember to take your gun with you, right? Um, think about how many people uh, forget their gun in a bathroom, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's just sitting there right in front of you and you've got all the time in the world to put the gun back on. If you need to get out of your vehicle in a hurry, um, you don't want to have to go back into your car to uh, grab the gun. Uh, you don't want to forget that it's in the car because your car is also not a holster and your car is not a gun safe. So we're actually going to talk a little bit about how do you go to the bathroom with your gun? This is actually something that every new concealed carrier has to figure out. And next week we're going to talk about that on our episode about the concealment lifestyle. Thanks a lot for joining us today, John, and thanks for watching the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, Caucus Live. Thanks for having me.